From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. It's a big day in Washington, with the House passing its version of the Build Back Better plan and the suspense continuing over the reappointment of Jay Powell as Fed Chair. For a rundown of this very busy day, we turn now to our Washington correspondent, Anne-Marie Hordern, who is at the White House. So, Anne-Marie, it's a toss-up. Which one do we start with? Let's start with the Fed, because this has got a lot more suspense with it than I thought it was going to, and if anything, maybe it heightened overnight. Yes, it certainly has heightened, and we're still waiting for the president to make that decision. What we do know is that it should come before Thanksgiving. And what I was reporting overnight, David, is that Senator Joe Manchin, who we know has taken issue with transitory inflation, he had a meeting already with Chair Jay Powell. He's setting up another meeting with Chair Jay Powell, and also his team is looking at meeting with Governor Brainard. He wants to sit down with her as well and get her thoughts on inflation and what kind of chair she would be. So it's very interesting to see this key senators start to play roles. We also heard this morning from Senator Merkley as well as Senator Whitehouse putting out a joint statement saying that Jay Powell should not be reappointed because of his stance on climate change. And if you look at just the most recent press conference from the chair in early November, when asked about whether or not the Fed should take a stance on telling banks that they should not be loaning to, say, fossil fuel or coal companies, which we should note is also important for Senator Manchin. He said, no, that's not in our mandate. That's up for Congress to decide and then give us a mandate. So you can see potentially progressives really maybe starting to put their weight behind Governor Brainard because climate change and what the Fed should do about it is really becoming a key focus of this race for the top spot at the Fed. Yeah, I must say, Maria, it shows why that's such a hard job because as he testifies up on Capitol Hill, the Republicans don't want him to go as far on climate change. The, a lot of the progressives wanted to go farther. So he's sort of yes. between a rock and a hard place. The other big issue, of course, is that Bill Beck better. We did get a vote in the House finally. It did approve. Tell us about what happens next. Yeah, and you saw the Democrats on the floor, David, fist bumping, dancing. They were so excited about this. But this is just one hurdle they pass. Yes, it's certainly a big day and it's a key hurdle for the Democratic Party. But then it goes to the Senate. And you and I both know that with the slimmest majorities they can have, 50 Democratic senators they need to get on board. We already knew that there's been issues leading up to this day with Senator Manchin when it comes to things like fossil fuels, Senator Sinema when it comes to taxes. But any individual senator can have an issue with a provision or a policy and hold up this bill. And there's less than two weeks of technical working days. Yes, they can stay late or potentially come back on their recess. But this is just one of the issues they need to clear. And Senator Schumer says they want to get it done before Christmas on top of a looming debt ceiling in the middle of December, a stopgap funding measure. Uh, also, a defense authorization bill, a climate, um, a China competitive bill, as well as potentially the start of a Fed hearing, David. Yeah, we've been hearing about these deadlines forever, but uh, sooner or later, they're going to be real. Thank you so much. Always great to have you with us. That's Anne-Marie Hordern reporting from the White House today. Earlier today, we talked with Marty Walsh. She's the Secretary of Labor about what the Build Back Better package passed by the House would mean for workers. Well, first of all, it's, transform it's transformational. Uh, this bill... Uh, it, it, this bill is a historic bill for the country. Uh, there's investments in child care, uh, investments in elder care, uh, investments in, in, in pharmaceuticals and, and, and bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, there's investments in, in education, long-term universal pre-kindergarten, uh, child care. Uh, there's investments in job training, workforce development, apprenticeships, particularly when you think about, for, at least for the Department of Labor standpoint, when you think about a lot, the, lots of the conversations in, in the country right now are about what's going on in, in the, in the work, work world. Uh, we have an opportunity to help find, and people find new careers uh, and get into the middle class. And th th there are a lot of great aspects. It's the real first time I, that I remember in the history of our country that we've made an investment like this in people. Uh, and I think that that that's going to be a game changer for a lot of families in America and creating pathways into the middle class. Secretary Walsh, what does it mean potentially for Department of Labor and its ability to enforce things like wage and hour laws and regulations and also uh, safety and health regulations? Well, you know, one thing, since I've been here as Secretary of Labor, a lot of people look at uh, enforcement of wage, of wage and hour and of 
OSHA as, as, as not necessarily a good thing. It looks like it's anti-business, and that's not the case. I would love to get us here at the Department of Labor at OSHA and Wage and Hour, where we're actually informing companies and helping them making sure the job sites are safe. And, and for, for, for too long, we, we've been somewhat of a reactionary um, departments where we've been called to a scene of an accident on a job site or we've been called to a, a job site where uh, an employee might might not have gotten their proper wages. And I would love to be able to get to the point here where we're doing education as well, working collectively with companies, working with businesses, working with people uh, to, to make sure that job sites are safe. When I was a, a young person, younger person, I, I worked in town, Boston, as a construction worker, and OSHA would come on the job site. And what they would do at that time, they weren't coming on in response to an accident. They were coming on doing inspections to make sure the job sites are safe. And what happens when you do that is you have safer job sites. And I think that it's important that, that we get back to those. So in this bill, uh, there's more enforcement for both of those departments, as well as the investments in, in, the, in, the, in the jobs and training. Uh, one of the big concerns across the country right now is inflation. And as you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, wages are going up. Actually, prices are going up faster than wages. What would the effect of the Build Back Better plan be on inflation? A lot of people are concerned to spend even more money in the economy right now. It takes us in the wrong direction. Yeah, you know, certainly we're all, we've all acknowledged that the, that inflation is real and that we're moving towards towards to, towards working on that. Uh, one way we're doing that in this bill is by increasing the people's ability to get into better paying jobs. Uh, the economists have said uh, that, that this will help us reduce inflation uh, as we move forward here. Uh, and certainly uh, there's more that we have to do as well. I mean, obviously the supply chain is a big issue as well. Uh, we have to make sure that, that, particularly on the West Coast, we have to make sure that, that we ease that supply chain. The president's been very focused on that uh, in, in making sure that turning the ports into 24 7. And now I'm going out to Los Angeles in a couple of weeks to talk to some trucking companies and, and the ports about how do we continue to stay on top of that. That's very important. I think almost 60 percent of all pro products that come into the United States of America come into the port of L.A. Uh, so, so we need to make sure that, that port's working properly. Mr. Secretary, do we want wages to catch up with the prices? Because obviously we don't want real wages to go down. That hurts the worker. But on the other hand, if we really catch the wages up to pr prices, won't that just feed the beast of inflation? Well, I, I just think, you know, when it comes to inflation, I just think it's really important for us. You know, uh, I know that they're connected, but, but for a second here, I just want to separate them. Uh, too many Americans in this country uh, are not earning good wages. Too many Americans in this country don't have a chance to get into the middle class. Uh, too many families don't have that opportunity. You know, and I think that the president's plan of Build Back Better and, and what he said since he's been a candidate for president is to create a pathway into the middle class. And, and I think that the more people that we can create that pathway for uh, in, in marginalized communities that have been left behind for so long, uh, communities of color, women, so many people have not had a chance to get to get to the middle class and, 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 and experience that American dream. We need to, we need to do more there, and these these two bills will help us with that. And, and as far as inflation, we'll have the ability to be able to bring costs down. When people have the ability to, to be able to, if you have more supply of product and you have people earning more money, uh, I, I would say that's a recipe of success. Uh, Mr. Secretary, one of the priorities of President Biden since he came to office, and I know it's yours as well, is to really improve the lot of organized labor in particular. We're seeing perhaps some of the ramifications of that with, for example, the John Deere uh, contract that was negotiated, which leaves, looks like it's pretty good for workers. Can you really buttress, enforce, strengthen, or organized labor without feeding inflation and driving up wages? Well, I think organized labor in, in some cases has to do their work too. I mean, and, and the president certainly, uh, I, I would, I can, I think I've said this more than one time. This is the uh, one of the probably the most pro labor, pro union administrations in the history of the country. Uh, in saying that, you know, organized labor has a role to play as well. I mean, they have to go out there, whether it's a, whether it's a, a current contract, existing contract, or new contracts to let people know that that we can collectively work together uh, with businesses to move businesses forward. Uh, the contracts, some of the disputes that we're seeing around the country, some of it is over wages and 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 healthcare and and pensions. But a lot of some of it's over working conditions too. So the concerns that people have in this country right now, generally, not just organized labor people, but everyone, uh, their concern is making sure they're going into a safe work environment. Uh, we're still living in a pandemic time. 
Uh, and I think that some of these contracts are really are, are about work conditions, which is something we really haven't seen in, in, in quite a bit. Secretary Walsh, uh, one of the things that could alleviate some of the wage pressure and some of the inflation would be a higher participation rate in the labor market. As you know, we are below where we were before the pandemic. And particularly hard hit have been some subgroups, such as, for example, women. What are you seeing on the participation front and what can the Department of Labor do about it? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that there's, there's kind of a, a tale of two stories here. One is that we're not seeing the participation rate that we would like to see in the country. Uh, obviously, there are millions of jobs that are open, and we need to get those jobs filled. But in the, on, on the next 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 breath, uh, we have an unemployment rate of 4.6 percent. Uh, President, since President Biden's been in office, we've added 5.6 million jobs to the economy. Uh, that's a faster recovery than was pre originally predicted. Uh, so, so we have to just continue to move forward one step at a time here. Uh, the Department of Labor, we're, we're doing in, in many different areas. Number one is we're, we're encouraging people that, that are looking for employment or change careers to reach out to the American job centers. We have them all across the country in partnerships with states and cities all across America, 2,800 in total. Uh, working on that. We are also working on uh, the, the emergency temporary standard that we put forth that we're having a, a, court, a court discussion right now with, but that was to get people vaccinated or tested inside working facilities so people could feel comfortable and safe going back to work. Uh, but, but there's no question about it that we have to we have to continue. It's not just the Department of Labor or the federal government. It's also private sector. We need to collectively work together to get people back to work. That was my interview with Marty Walsh. She's the U.S. Secretary of Labor. Coming up, COVID is making a comeback in Europe. What about in the United States? We asked Dr. Stephen Corwin of the New York Presbyterian Hospital. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. As you and Anne Marie were discussing moments ago on Capitol Hill, House Democrats passed President Biden's $1.6 trillion economic agenda. The plan expands the social safety net, addresses climate change, and rewrites tax policies. The 220 to 213 vote comes after months of intra party squabbling. The legislation now goes to the Senate where its fate remains uncertain. Democratic senators are expected to make extensive changes before voting on it, uh, potentially in December. Former Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton took a swipe at cryptocurrencies, saying they have the power to weaken entire countries. Secretary Clinton what spoke today like during a, a panel discussion at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore. Uh, literally mine uh, new coins in order to trade with them has the potential for undermining uh, currencies, for undermining the uh, uh, role of the dollar as the reserve currency, for destabilizing nations. Mrs. Clinton says governments around the world also face a range of new challenges, including disinformation and artificial intelligence. COVID-19 booster shots from Moderna, Pfizer, and BioNTech are cleared by U.S. regulators for all Americans 18 and older. It means millions of people are now eligible for extra protection as concern about a potential winter wave of infection grows. The FDA says adults who received their second dose of the shot at least six months ago are now eligible to get a third. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> COVID cases are on the rise again in Europe, with Austria now announcing a national lockdown starting next week. And cases in the United States at least appear to have stopped their decline. To explain the situation, we welcome back now Dr. Stephen Corwin. He's president and CEO of New York Presbyterian Hospital, consistently ranked number one in the New York area, as well as number five nationwide. So, Dr. Corwin, thank you for, so much for being back with us. I'm going to ask the question everybody has on their mind, whether you can answer or not. Are we going to see another wave in the United States coming up as we go back inside? I think so, David. I think you're seeing an uptick now. I think that we're getting into the cold weather in, in the northern part in, in uh, North America. So I think we're going to see an uptick. Uh, I think that whether we call it a wave or not depends on how high that surge goes. But I think we will see a surge 
uh, and hopefully it will not be as severe as the last set of surges we've had last winter and, of course, Delta variant this summer. Uh, but I think it's inescapable that we're still not out of the pandemic and we'll see, uh, we'll see some surge in the wintertime. It will be worse if we don't uh, really encourage people to get flu vaccinations. Uh, right now, we're seeing uh, not as high an uptake of flu vaccination as we would like. So uh, we're, we're buckling up for what could be a, a, a surge as we get into uh, wintertime. So you're in a particular position here in the New York area to see what's happening day to day in your own operations at your hospital system. What are you seeing so far? Are you seeing an uptick we in bounced, cases uh, and hospitalizations? Bounced, yeah. What are you seeing? We bounced, uh, we've bounced along our lows now for a few months, in part because uh, of the uh, vaccination efforts within the state, which, is, uh, which have been good. Uh, uh, but we're expecting an uptick. We've seen the uptick elsewhere. You mentioned the uptick in, uh, in Europe, the Austrian lockdown. So I think it would be foolish for uh, Americans to think that we're not going to have uh, an, an increase this winter. Are we better prepared than we were the last time? I guess the answer must be yes. But how are you preparing? And to what extent does this pill perhaps give you at least some reinforcements? There's no question that we're better prepared. And I think as these surges come, uh, the more people that are vaccinated, the more people that get boosted, uh, then uh, ICU capacity, which is the critical element here, intensive care capacity, uh, won't be overly strained. And I think that's the, the critical piece. Of course, we've seen... Uh, workforce shortages, as you've talked about in prior segments, so that will impact us negatively. Uh, and we're seeing some supply uh, some supply chain issues on what used to be considered rather routine items, and we're working through that. So there's still a lot of headwinds there, but I think we are much better prepared. I think we will be better. Um, and I think to uh, to the earlier points about the boosters, get the booster. And if you haven't gotten vaccinated, get vaccinated. That will help a, a great deal. One of the things a lot of us have learned about public health, you knew already, is so much of it is the psychology of the masses. It's not just what you do at the hospital, but how we react to it. Uh, is there a danger here that we've all become a little bit tired of this, maybe inured to it? And so if they ask us to go back inside, wear masks, do all those things, we'll resist it? We're going to have a tough time getting people to go inside, wear masks, and lock down again. I don't see that as uh, a feasible path going forward. We've already seen a lot of resistance to this. We're tired of it as a country. I think the best thing for us is let's make sure to encourage people to get vaccinated. I'm glad the FDA came out with that booster advisement. I think it should have been done earlier. Um, I think the only uh, uh, caveat I would give is if you've had the J and J vaccine and you're more than two months out, get the booster and you can mix and match. Uh, so you can mix it with the Pfizer or the Moderna. Uh, I think the evidence is very clear that immunity wanes uh, with Pfizer and Moderna after six months, get the booster. And when J and J, it starts at the two to three month interval. So get the booster. I think that's really our ticket. I don't think the country would be prepared for anything resembling another lockdown. I think it may halt the opening in terms of how open we get, but I think we're on an inexorable course of opening the economy, as I think we should. Uh, but we're still not in the endemic phase of this uh, of this pandemic. We're still in the pandemic phase. Dr. Corn, you mentioned uh, the the pressures being put on your people, on doctors and nurses, a lot of the healthcare workers. They're tired of this as well, goodness knows. Take us into that a bit, because I know you've had some issues there with some nurses who are saying, you know, we're overstretched. Are you having trouble getting enough people? Well, we're seeing job shortages across the country, nursing job shortages. We're seeing shortages in radiology technicians, uh, laboratory technicians. We've had people leave the workforce because they were burnt out. Uh, we're recruiting now, believe it or not, David, uh, my hospital, 10 hospital system, we're recruiting over 250 nurses per month. So uh, we that's a, an enormous number for us. Uh, fortunately, our turnover rate has been relatively low. In other systems, the turnover rate has been in double digits. Typically, a nursing turnover rate is in the 4 to 5 percent range. Uh, in many systems now, it's 13, 14 percent. So uh, I think you're seeing pressure on nursing, nursing staffing. I think you're seeing real pressure in some of the ancillary uh, uh, specialties, particularly in laboratory technologists, radiology technologists. So, um, and that creates 
substantial wage pressure. So uh, yeah. we're seeing an inflationary spiral without question. Just my if question. Put, Just my question. Yeah. What are you seeing in terms of wage spiral? You have to pay more money if you want to get these people. No question. I mean, you're seeing a real competition around nurses, uh, nursing signing bonuses, uh, traveling nurses getting $10,000 to $15,000 signing bonuses. God only knows the nurses are worth every penny that they get. But you're seeing real wage pressure. And if you couple that with uh, uh, price inflation, it creates a problem. Of our 48,000 employees, we have 7,000 employees that need to access food bank resources through us. These are our minimum wage is $20 an hour. So you can imagine a substantial increase in bread, milk, egg price, let alone gasoline price. Uh, that's not made up for by uh, a three or 4% wage increase. That yeah. affects somebody right now. Uh, and we're seeing that. Yeah. It's always such a pleasure to have you with us and really helpful. Thank you. That's Dr. Stephen Corwin. He's the CEO of New York Presbyterian Hospital System. A programming note now, Wall Street Week airs tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We'll hear from Larry Summers, John Graham of CPP, Catherine Keating of BNY Mellon, and former IBM CEO Sam Palmasano. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Both Pfizer and Moderna got new FDA approvals today for their COVID booster shots, making them our two, now one but two, stocks of the hour. And here with the story is Dave Wilson. So, big news. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can argue it's a bit anticlimactic because so many states were allowing people yeah. 18 years or older to get the boosters, regardless of uh, the lack of advice from the U.S. regulators. Nonetheless, I mean, it's all set. And it, it looks like a big deal for Moderna in terms of the stock reaction and arguably uh, Pfizer's German partner BioNTech in terms of U.S. trading, uh, which is understandable because you look at Moderna, you look at BioNTech, they are far more dependent on you know COVID-19 sales than Pfizer, which has a fairly diverse business. Now, you know, we should note Moderna can definitely use the help because they came out last quarter, you know, cutting their full year projections in terms of revenue, in terms of the number of COVID-19 doses they would produce. So the idea that they're getting this uh, uh, approval, emergency use authorization, definitely a plus for them. But we should note, I mean, it's it's a positive for Pfizer too, because this is a company, as much as you think about all the drugs drugs they provide 60% of revenue in the latest quarter uh, coming from uh, specifically the COVID-19 vaccine. It, it shows you how dependent Pfizer is. So the idea that, you know, now you'll be able to uh, sell these additional doses, uh, definitely a plus for these companies. Doesn't hurt the brand either. Thank you so much to Dave Wilson. He's our stocks editor. Coming up, KPMG chief economist Constance Hunter on the state of the economy and the threat of inflation. This is Balance of Power. We're on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Austria will impose a nationwide lockdown next week, and Germany may make a similar move. Johns Hopkins professor and virologist Andrew Pekos tells Bloomberg it's all part of Europe's effort to cope with a deadly surge in the coronavirus pandemic. We've got cases in Germany, in Austria, that are higher than at any time in this pandemic, higher than before we had vaccines, before we had antivirals, before we even knew much about how this virus was transmitting. You've got a window of time now where these record numbers of cases are going to be, continue to climb for at least seven days. Austria is now mandating that all residents get vaccine shots. That's one of the most stringent inoculation requirements in the region. Tesla's female employees face, quote, rampant sexual harassment. That's according to a lawsuit by a woman who works in the Fremont, California factory. Tesla didn't immediately respond to a request for comment. The case comes as the electric car maker is already facing a staggering $137 million verdict in favor of another worker who said he experienced pervasive racism at the same factory. President Biden briefly transferred power to Vice President Kamala Harris Friday while he was under anesthesia for a colonoscopy. 
marking the first time a woman officially served as acting commander-in-chief. The president was at Walter Reed National Medical Center for his physical. Mr. Biden turns 79 tomorrow. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you, Mark. Earlier today, we talked with Harvard's Larry Summers for tonight's edition of Wall Street Week, and we asked Larry whether the Fed should change its approach because of inflation or stay the course to avoid appearing inconsistent. I think that the desire to maintain credibility when you've made a big mistake is the source of some of the biggest disasters we've had in the United States. That's what caused 55,000 soldiers to die in Vietnam. That's what kept us in a 20-year war in Afghanistan. What's most important is that policy have uh, credibility as competent and able to respond to changing events. And that's what we need uh, now. When the Fed put forward that framework, it had no contemplation that there would be COVID. It had no contemplation that we'd have record labor shortages. It had no contemplation that we'd have annual inflation rates on the CPI running above uh, 6%. And so it has to uh, adjust uh, in the face of that. There's another lesson uh, to learn, which is none of us know the future. And so confident statements about what's going to happen by public officials and confident statements about intention to act and what they're going to do rather than about objectives often turn out to be uh, embarrassing. And so the Fed needs to be much, much more careful than it has been in recent years about its uh, pronouncements. Forward guidance has mostly been a failure. The market doesn't particularly believe what the Fed says, and so it doesn't really have that much uh, impact on, on rates going on long-term rates. But the Fed then does feel constrained by what it's said in the past, and so it's pushed into errors in the name of uh, credibility. So an approach that is much more recognizing of uncertainty and carries with it much more humility is uh, the right way forward uh, for uh, monetary policy. You can hear more of my interview with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers on Wall Street Week. That'll be airing tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern time. For her thoughts on inflation, the Fed, and the economy, welcome now Constance Hunter. She's chief economist for KPMG. Constance, thank you so much for being back with us. You heard what Larry had to say. We know he's very concerned about inflation. How concerned are you about inflation? Should we be changing our approach? Well, so yes, I am concerned. We uh, just put out our chart book today. Um, you can find it at KPMG's uh, Chief Economist website. And we actually took the time to define the word transitory. So probably all of your viewers are thinking right now, I know what transitory means. It means not permanent. That is the de def definition when you look it up in the dictionary. But I think with regard to inflation, transitory inflation, what is referring to is not a time dependent thing, but a state dependent thing, right? And the state that, that this inflation is dependent upon is COVID. And as you had in your segment right before Larry Summers was on, we see these rising cases in Austria and Germany. It's very alarming. These countries have high vaccination rates. So this pandemic and the state of being, of being in this pandemic is going on so much longer than anybody anticipated. So bringing it back to Larry, I mean, he's right. It's hard to make predictions, especially with something as uncertain as this. And so we could see a situation where inflation continues to be entrenched because the pandemic is ongoing. And here, all the Fed has is credibility and forward guidance, right? So, so Constance, as I talk to economists such as you, the thing I hear recurrently is the question really depends on the labor market and mm -hmm. to a significant degree, the extent to which wages will go up, because once wages start going up, you might have a real problem. And that in turn may depend on how many people are available to work. We've reduced the participation rate. Is there a danger that's structural at this point? So we go into this in great depth in the chart book. So the first thing I would say is there's some really interesting work out of the Kansas City Fed 
which demonstrates that if you have positive momentum in the labor market, you can have wage increases, but they don't necessarily translate into higher CPI. And part of what they explicitly measure are things like continuing claims and labor force participation and ISM uh, employment indices. But we think that there's an unmeasured component there that might have something to do with productivity, right? So as long as you have that momentum going up, you don't have the wage increases passed through to inflation. The key here though, is that participation, right? And we know that there are people out of the labor force because we have 10% fewer childcare workers than prior to the pandemic, right? So you have 10% of the labor force, 1.64 million people that have children under the age of six that are potentially impacted by this lack of childcare workers. Then you have long COVID. That is approximately 500,000 to 1.3 million people who can't work because they are, they are afflicted with long COVID. Then you have um, the fact that we had 2 million people over the age of 55 retire during this pandemic. So, so if we look at this all together, we're looking at a lot of people that are not in the labor force that, that some economists assume will come back next year and so that everything will chug along. We're saying we think there's a strong risk they don't come back next year. And if we continue to have jobs growth anywhere similar to what we had, or we have seen recently, really, 300,000 a month is sort of our, our lowest estimate, then we are going to get to below a 4% unemployment rate. So now we have a situation where we're below 4% unemployment. We have inflation clocking in at around 4%. And I think the Fed is going to have to act. And I think this happens regardless of who the chair is, right? So that is, those are conditions where, where the Fed is going to have to act. And the question is, do those conditions arise next summer? Or can do, do we wait until September? Well, and also I wonder, Constance, if part of the question is, do we have a soft landing, as it were? Because Larry, from the beginning, has said, look it, if in fact the, the Fed can react, because Jay Powell, the chair, has said they will react, mm -hmm. then the danger is you could throw it into a recession, because people are not expecting it. If actually they do taper faster and start hiking faster, we could really disrupt the economy more fundamentally could we not? I mean, I think they have time. And I think actually, I, I don't know, you know, predictions are hard, especially about the future, right? As you <laughs> said, but, but I mean, look, I think that there's a way to message this. I think they'll be able to engineer a dovish tightening and say, listen, we're taking a little alcohol out of the punch bowl, but we're still accommodative. We're far from that 2% um, long-term Fed funds rate, but over the next year, it's conceivable we could raise interest rates at 100 basis points and just kind of take a little alcohol out of the punch bowl and engineer that soft landing. I mean, I think that is the goal. And I, I think there is language and messaging and forward guidance that they can provide that will help them achieve this. So here's the unfair question, but it is the parlor game right now in Washington. And that is, if these concerns are in President Biden's mind, does it affect at all his decision coming up about who's going to be the chair of the Fed going forward, as well as the other openings there? It's a package deal, potentially. So I actually think that um, he's focused on other things, right? So, so, and that's because if you look at the the voices in the party who are who are calling for a new Fed chair, they're focused on other things, right? They're focused on how, to what extent does the Fed take into account or nudge policy around ESG and environment in particular? To what extent um, does the Fed pay attention to, to overall governance issues? So I think that, that this issue of, of the reaction function is you're splitting hairs between uh, Lael Brainerd and, and Chairman Powell. You really are. I think it comes down to other issues. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. Always helpful to have you with us, Constance. That's Constance Hutter. She's KPMG's chief economist. Coming up, what came out of the meeting between President Biden and Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador? With former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, he's Chris Landau. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Biden met at the White House yesterday with his Mexican counterpart, that's Andres Manuel López Obrador, with immigration, the climate, and autos on the agenda, as well as other things. Welcome now the former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, Chris Landau, who served under President Trump. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. You're the expert, I'm not. Of the things that we've heard about come out of this, what do you put at the top of the list in terms of what they talked about? I think the most important thing, David, is the fact that they got together and actually had this conversation and formed the basis for a relationship. I think it's very important that the president of Mexico, the president of the United States, look each other in the eye, be able to pick up the phone and call each other. Uh, there's a lot on the common agenda with Mexico. I mean, the border, drugs, economics. And I think all those uh, you know, were hopefully on the agenda. Uh, they were all covered to some degree or other in the uh, in the press release that covered the U.S. and Mexico bilateral meeting, and then there was a trilateral meeting with Canada as well. You know, I think this is uh, an incredibly important relationship for the United States. A lot of people don't re realize that Mexico is, I think, our largest trading partner yeah. at the moment. It's always one, two, or three up there with Me with China and Canada, and uh, you know, the, the, it's a very important economic relationship for the United States. Let's talk about the economic relationship just for a moment, because obviously we have the USMCA negotiated under your old boss, President Trump. Uh, there have been some issues now about content, uh, particularly when it comes to automobiles. Uh, how is the situation right now under the USMCA? Is it working? Is there a dispute that needs to be resolved? You know, it's still too early to tell, I would say. The USMCA went into effect just over a year ago, but obviously all our countries have been dealing with the pandemic uh, as our first priority since then. So I think... Uh, the institutions, uh, the, the, the practices and procedures under the USMCA have not gone into effect uh, as quickly as we would have hoped, uh, obviously given the underlying circumstances. You know, I think the different countries have some different perspectives on some of these issues. The USMCA was certainly an attempt to modernize NAFTA, bring it into a new world with the reality of competition against China. And I certainly hope that the USMCA can be a framework for strengthening our three countries together, uh, as particularly on the global stage, when you look at China. And, uh, you know, that's going to take uh, some joint effort of, of all three leaders. Climate is very much in the agenda right now after COP26. We also have the energy issues across that border. Give us a sense about where there are opportunities as well as some challenges between the United States and Mexico. Well, there are certainly some challenges and opportunities in the energy sector in Mexico. Mexico has... Uh, a lot of potential for solar and wind. It's a big country, and uh, I think there's a lot of concern in Mexico and around the world uh, about President López Obrador's uh, energy policies. He is a, uh, a nationalist president. I think he'd be the first to say that. And he has the view that energy uh, should be primarily the responsibility of the state and is looking to, in his view, uh, have a more level playing field between the state companies, the state electricity company, the state uh, petroleum company, and uh, foreign investors, which uh, were allowed into the Mexican energy sector in the last administration of President Peña Nieto. And so President López Obrador has been really pushing to uh, get more preferential treatment for the Mexican state actors in the Mexican energy scene much of the dismay of U.S. and other foreign investors who invested particularly heavily in the renewable sector. So it's, an it's, it's, it's a very important issue on the bilateral agenda. The uh, minutes of yesterday's meetings and, and the, the readouts and statements really gloss over the issue, which is pretty standard for these kind of things. People like to talk about you know, the happy talk that everybody can agree <laughs> on. But this is, you know, this is a big issue on the bilateral agenda. You know, Mexico is obviously a sovereign country to decide the future of its own energy industry, but I think if it wants to attract uh, foreign investment, it's got to respect the reasonable investment-backed expectations of the folks who invested there. Ambassador Lando, let's pick up on what you just said about the readout on it and the statement that was released. Released, There was no news conference. They didn't actually appear before camera and talk. They just issued a new, uh, press release, as I understand it. A as an ambassador, as a diplomat, and the son, by the way, of a career foreign service of officer, should we read anything into that? Does that make it less important? Was there more conflict than we might have anticipated? I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, a lot of times on these things, people want to keep it pretty scripted so that nobody uh, goes off and says something that's awkward for the others. So I think 
Uh, a lot of times there's a preference just to leave it to these statements that are often kind of hammered out by staff. And I think they did a good job hammering this out and at least putting some things down in writing in terms of things we've got to focus on on the agenda. I think it's too bad that the presidents didn't take uh, questions in real time, because I do think that gives a sense, really, of what it is that they talked about. I mean, I think you can pretty much assume that the presidents may not even have read uh, some of the stuff that comes out in writing about their meetings, uh, that that's handled at the staff level. So I think it is nice to have a window. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that there wasn't a, a um, uh, you know, live uh, Q&A yeah. here, but I think it's unfortunate. And finally, Mr. Ambassador, uh, let's assume you were back in your old job as U.S. Ambassador in Mexico, and you're writing a memo to President Biden right now saying, what's the priority going forward? What's the first thing that these two countries should work together? What would you put at the top of the list? The border, no question. I mean, I think our southern border is a mess right now, and I think border security is fundamental to the United States' national security, and I think we need to and can work more closely with Mexico, as we did, frankly, in, in the past administration, to address what is a common challenge to our countries. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of immigrants now are coming not from Mexico itself, but from all over the world. Uh, you know, Congo, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Haiti, Cuba, they, they come to Mexico in order to come into the United States uh, illegally. And that is a challenge uh, both for Mexico and the United States, and, and I'd like to see more focus put on, on that uh, cooperation in that regard. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm not sure how to make progress. I'm not sure if we know yet what the true policy of the Biden administration is, but maybe time will tell. It's really great to have you with us today. I hope you'll come back and talk some more about U.S.-Mexican relations. That's Chris Landau. He's the former United States ambassador to Mexico. Coming up, we're going to turn to the last day of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum and over in Singapore. We're going to hear from former Secretary of State and former presidential candidate. She's Hillary Clinton. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The fourth annual Bloomberg New Economy Forum has concluded in Singapore. And on the last day, we heard from the former Secretary of State and former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. Of course we have to cooperate. We should cooperate on a range of issues. But we also cannot permit the kind of aggressive uh, military buildup, the kind of uh, efforts to dominate uh, maritime navigation, uh, the intimidation of uh, nations in the larger Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and we also have seen a very serious and important defense uh, move by the United States, the UK, and Australia uh, to buttress Australia as uh, a strong uh, partner in uh, a superior military uh, presence. So the Biden administration, at least from uh, uh, the public uh, efforts that have been uh, going on, is trying to strike that balance that we heard uh, President Biden express in his recent uh, virtual uh, summit with uh, President Xi Jinping. I think that a lot of what will happen in the region uh, depends upon how other nations perceive the competition. Uh, and that is not only within uh, Asia, but also uh, further afield in Europe, in Africa, even Latin America. Uh, because other nations will also have to make the determination as to how they engage in cooperation with China uh, cooperation with the United States and our allies, uh, and how they maximize their own interests uh, in the midst of this uh, very clear and growing uh, competition uh, between the United States and China. 
That was former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum talking about U.S. relations with China. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. Today's top story is on the challenges for President Biden's agenda despite the House passing Build Back Better. A programming note, we'll have Wall Street Week on again tonight at 6 p.m. We'll hear from Larry Summers, John Graham of CPP, Catherine Keating of BNY Mellon, and former IBM CEO Sam Palmisano. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. Please join us there in our second hour. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.